Hi there, um, my name's Sam Clark and I head up Conjure. We're a digital agency based in London and uh, we have uh, <clears throat> two main wings of the business. One is we design and build mobile applications for a range of different brands and the second is we design <coughs> HMIs, uh, human machine interfaces for a uh, range, uh, range of vehicles and, and motorbikes. And, um, Today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the work we do on the HMI front in automotive. Um, I'm going to touch on vehicle personality and where I see uh, UX, uh, UX and UI design, but obviously mainly UX design going, um, uh, going today. So I'm going to start with a very short showreel. Um, I'm not sure how loud this is going to be, uh, but I'll give you a quick flavour of some of the work we've produced to date. If I can get this to play. Yes. <laughs> So I'd like to start with a, with a story, um, uh, which is a little bit away from what I just showed you there. <clears throat> Back in the, the late 70s, uh, the band Van Halen played enormous stadium gigs um, all over the UK and all over the world. And ahead of the gig, the band would arrive, and uh, Van Halen himself would make his way to the green room. And there he would stride past all the, uh, the drugs and the, the booze and the groupies, if there were some, and make his way up to a bowl of M&Ms, which he had placed on the table. And he would root his way through that bowl, looking for only brown M&Ms. And if he found one, he would immediately cancel the gig, and the band would walk out, and that would be the end of that. Now, this might sound like a prima donna move, but it was actually, <laughs> actually a safety thing. Um, uh, when they were running these gigs, they had an enormous amount of electrics and pyrotechnics um, and all sorts of whiz-bang gear on stage. And they had a 100-point safety list that had to be adhered to in order to make sure the stage, the stage was safe to use. And item 45 on that safety list was, I want a bowl of brown m and uh, sorry, a bowl of M&Ms in the green room with no brown M&Ms. So when he went in there, if he found a brown M&M, he knew the list hasn't been adhered to correctly and, uh, and the stage wasn't safe and uh, they would bugger off. Fast forward um, uh, to the, uh, the present day, and me and the team were testing the HMI on the, the new Ford GT, and we'd gone to extreme lengths uh, to make sure that the, the system was working, that all the information on demand screens were in there, the tachometers were working, and everything else. And we were doing an executive prove out, so a man whose second name was Ford was coming down to, to give it a try. And the first thing the guy did when he got in is he grabbed the mode selector on the steering wheel and started ramming it up and down as fast as he could. Um, this is something we hadn't tested for, and we had a couple of extreme errors all at the same time. The Prindom, which is park, reverse, normal, drive, and manual, um, got stuck, as did the, uh, the word normal, which was a drive state. Um, there was a component with a masking error, and we ended up in a situation where on the left, we, we ended up with that. Um, suffice to say, we all, we all got pretty badly told off. We now have our 100-point checklist when it comes to getting, uh, getting these HMIs out the door, and our number 45 on that list is, is there any way of creating profanity, uh, let's make sure that that isn't going to happen. <laughs> the, but this, uh, this leads me on to this eye for detail, um, and it's, uh, it's obviously Van Halen's eye for detail. Um, for us, it's this eye for detail. And eye for detail is what makes us UX, as, you know, stand out as UX designers, and, um, and it's important across the board. I mean, the eye itself is uh, an interesting part of the body because it's the one part of the body that has the highest amount of color contrast um, between the iris, the iris and the white. Now, this is useful for us um, both as humans because when we walk into a room, we can instantly scan a room and see who is looking where. And it's also useful from a technology perspective when we're using eye tracking software, which I'm going to touch on now. Ideas and solutions for some of the challenges we have can come from strange places. How many people have ever um, had to look after children on a beach? Can I see a show of hands? 
Anyone? Right, then you'll know that tracking free moving targets at the same time is a monolithic effort. Um, we're actually not bad at it as humans. Um, we can kind of keep an eye on this. Um, but more than that, we have the ability to see problems before they arise. And um, it was one of our uh, UX designers who was going um, uh, on holiday with actually with the friend's children. And um, she was uh, doing her bit to keep track. And she spotted one of the younger child um, children was about to get knocked over. By, um, uh, by a wave. So she was able to preempt that. She saw that coming. Now, fast forward to a project we were working on um, last year. We were working with a, a business which were putting software in vehicles which would keep an eye on the eyes, waiting um, to see if the eyes would close, basically trying to track drowsiness inside of, inside of drivers. Now, that was separate to what we were doing, but we had been tasked with trying to find a, a way of getting driver input on aiding the autonomous system in spotting um, problems before they come. And as humans, we're very, very good at this. We can, we can spot the problem um, in advance, and, uh, and hardware and software really does struggle with that currently. We um, opted in the end to reduce a little bit of the CPU power on the vehicle. So we've reduced it to about 90% of tracking um, from 360 around and kept 10% in reserve. And then by using the camera and keeping an eye on the, um, on the eyes, if, the, if the, the passenger or the, or the rider spotted something in the distance, they generally tend to freeze and stay focused on that. Using the eye tracking, we were like, yeah, we, we know something's wrong. There's an irregular action here. They're focused on one thing. And then we can swing that last percentage of CPU power to extend the range of LiDAR and try and work out what that is. In the mobile world, facial recognition is coming in. Um, obviously, Apple have had that for years, and Android have just started catching up. But the, the way facial recognition will be used inside vehicles going forward, unlocking, recognizing passengers, recognizing um, uh, the different positions of people in the vehicle. This is all coming. Eye tracking is already there. So in terms of your vehicle recognizing you, this is, this is just around the corner. And, um, and it's a, in terms of an interaction, where you're going to be interacting with a vehicle, this is going to be a big one. But I'll come back to that in a moment. The second is, is air gesture. Um, Gesturing is absolutely innate for us, again, as humans. Uh, we do it when we're on the phone and people can't even see us. We'll wave our hands around in the air. And we're seeing that coming into um, uh, various top-line vehicles, and that will filter down, too. Curiously, we're seeing a little bit of a return to skeuomorphic design. Um, there's no set standard for, for gestures currently. Um, so if you're, in a, if you're in a Renault, you move your finger across like this um, to increase the volume, whereas in a Mercedes, you do this as if you're turning a, an invisible volume knob. So we've A, yet to see a standard there, and B, there's this kind of hint of, of skeuomorphic design coming back in that regard. So we have facial recognition, and we have gesture control. And then obviously we have voice. And um, outside of the vehicle, the, we've seen that the rise of, um, uh, of, of course, Siri, and then um, Alexa in the, in, in the form of the Echo. And the, the voice control is an interesting case study, because if you have your Uber app linked to your your Echo, you can ask it to book you an Uber, and it confirms that there's one on the way. Um, you then, it will then take you to your destination. And then if you have a smartwatch, you can then you know, summon that Uber to return you home. And at no point have you actually looked at an interface or looked at your phone or gone through any of the, kind of the standard mobile application um, uh, actions that you would expect. And that's worth bearing in mind in an industry where a lot of, lot of weight is placed on, on the quality of wireframes and the actual physical screen. So the reason I've gone through these three um, kind of forms of interaction is that when we, when we gather them up, we start to get to a place where the interaction with the vehicle is becoming more and more um, uh, myriad, and it leaves us open to the ability to create a, a personality, um, create a, a, a kind of feedback with that, with that vehicle or with that device. And that leads us me on to the next question, which is what kind of personality we want. On the automotive side, um, <clears throat> there are different OEMs which are having different uh, kind of answers to this question. I mean, one of, the, one of the first is, do you talk directly to the vehicle? I mean, does it, does it talk to you? Um, alternatively, do you render a personality in the vehicle? And you know, in this case, Bentley's uh, idea of a, of, a, of a musty old white, white man in the, in the center. Rolls-Royce believe it might be somewhere in between. Um, they've created this kind of abstract Clio character, which is all ethereal and is uh, joining you on your, on your rolling, rolling living room. How many people are familiar with the Uncanny Valley in here? Can I see a show of hands? For about, about third, maybe? So the Uncanny Valley, um, I should have had a graph for this. I don't, I've just got the, the words. Um, but the, the Uncanny Valley is a phenomena um, in the 3D world where 
if you, as a 3D artist or animator, you try and reach a totally lifelike human character, which is completely indistinguishable from the real thing. And the closer, on a, on a graph, <coughs> you have the realism versus um, the kind of user fooledness. And you can get more and more and more lifelike, and, the, and the, the user, the person viewing it, becomes more and more in tune with his character until you get very, very close to absolute human perfection. And when you do, um, you have this phenomena, which is the uncanny valley, which is where the, the human just rejects it outright. And so the uncanny valley is that dip on the graph where it comes down. And if we're going to try and create real characters in our vehicles, as Bentley or want to do, that's going to cause, um, going to cause problems because the rider, the owner, the person interacting with that character will potentially outright reject them, and, um, and that's, not, that's not a good place to be. We, however, don't really believe that, um, uh, that you have to be that realistic with any kind of personality or any kind of um, uh, rendered character inside a vehicle. You can actually get away with, uh, with a lot less in order to create empathy. In fact, you don't even need a direct um, two-way interaction. You can simply have something which, which emotes in order to create empathy. Does anyone remember the first Tron? Not the, not the remake, the kind of the 80s one? Remember the little cube that used to follow the protagonist around? It could say two things. It could say yes, and it could say no. And it would kind of go angry red when it wasn't happy, and it would kind of expand green when it was kind of happy. And yet, with those simple two words and that simple action, they were able to create a, a personality which you, as a viewer of the film, created uh, empathy for. So we, we thought, well, let's, let's see what we could do. Could we pull the same trick um, with, uh, uh, with the vehicle? Um, could we find a way of visualizing the, the, heart of the, the heart of the car or the heart of the bike and, um, and start to give it emotions? The goal being to create a, a character, to create something which you're going to, going to be attached to, which would then have value outside of the vehicle. And the three emotions we decided to attack were aggression, injury, and illness. Aggression being the performance vehicle, you've got your foot down and something's going to feed back and you're going to empathize with that, with that emotion. Injury, physical damage to the vehicle, if something falls off or, um, or you take a dent or a crash or a suspension failure or similar. An illness, something internally wrong with the vehicle, software failure, low engine uh, oil temperature or similar. So we took a crack at it and, uh, and I've got a short video um, which will hopefully show these, um, uh, these three here. beginning of our experimentation was uh, with a unit that can emote. Naturally, the, the places that we could take this character um, uh, are, are many. We know that um, uh, mobile applications which are developing for, for our AMs um, will be following the user around, they'll be in your pocket. And a character like this could, could follow the user around too. When you open the mobile app, this character there could give you instant feedback into the state of the vehicle. If you had an um, Apple TV and you had your um, screensaver on, which had your, um, so your GT in the garage and you wanted to shot of the vehicle and something like that in the corner, then we can start to, to create real value there. When we were working our way through that, we were trying to find different ways of displaying these emotions, and, and aggression was, was straightforward. Injury required a, a, an animator's touch in order to give it that kind of slightly wounded, wounded look. And naturally, there had to be some sound that went with it. You didn't want it crying out in pain, but you had to have some kind of, some kind of sound there. But the illness one was interesting because how, how do you show disease without completely off-putting the, uh, off the user, but at the same time showing that something's wrong? And we came across this, um, uh, this term called um, uh, trypophobic. Is, is anyone familiar, familiar with this term? One. Can you describe what it is? Just, I'm just curious. Fear of small holes. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Yeah, the next picture, you'll know the one, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so this, um, 
This is actually a thing, um, and it's bizarrely, I, I have a bit of this too. Um, there's this um, understanding that some humans, some people, really struggle with, um, with, with holes like this, and it's based on this um, illness, this kind of innate um, uh, repulsion when you see something that makes you, reminds you of illness. So for our second uh, generation character, we're going to be take, taking these design cues from both the uh, psychological reaction that humans have and, and items like this in nature. When it comes to creating characterization, though, um, all the work isn't necessarily on us. We have, um, we have advantages um, because we, we as humans ourselves, uh, we naturally try and instill um, personality uh, in our objects. The, Famous social comment, uh, commentator John Ruskin coined the term uh, pathetic fallacy. And we see that in children. Um, they do that with their toys. You know, they will give their teddies um, uh, lifelike, um, uh, you know, lifelike ideas and they will talk with their teddies, etc. Uh, we do that as humans. We do it as, uh, as adults as well. Um, it was a good term, um, which quite well, the sentence quite well executes the idea of pathetic fallacy. Cars can't, can't hate and, uh, and they can't try. You know, they either do or they don't, and um, they're not capable of, of that kind of emotion, and yet we as humans prescribe that to, to the vehicles that we have. So we have a bit of an advantage in that regard, and as long as we don't stray too close to that uncanny valley, I believe that we can really create these, these, these personalities around the, the vehicles and outside of our vehicles, you know, devices in the home. But it does beg the question, why does, why does personality actually matter? You know, is it, why is this something that, that we need to be focusing on? And in the automotive uh, sector, it's, it's critically important because we have to begin building trust, especially with the advent of autonomous vehicles. Now, whether they come along in five years or 10 years or 15 years, uh, reading those runes is beyond the, uh, the scope of this talk, but trust is gonna be important because there are some people who are just never really gonna get on with it and we're gonna have a hard time convincing them as this video neatly demonstrates. <laughs> There's others that aren't going to take quite, quite such convincing. But the irony is it's not just the drivers that we, we need to be thinking about when it comes to, to, to building this trust and, and building these relationships. We have to think about the pedestrians as well. The ICT ran a study where they saw that 80% of pedestrians uh, crossing the road will attempt to make eye contact with the, with the driver. And in an autonomous vehicle, that most likely will not be possible. Um, the seats might be rotated, they might be talking to one another, windows might be screened down. So to counteract this, some of the brands are going to great lengths to try and convince pedestrians and drivers uh, alike that these, these are safe. Google have fundamentally turned their prototype into a toy. And <clears throat> They also did this to stop other vehicles bullying um, the cars on the road. If somebody spotted an autonomous car, they might start taking advantage of it. Semcom took it even further. They created a car which, um, which actually smiles at you. Um, the sensors around it and the cameras will, will look for the pedestrians, and if the pedestrian looks at the vehicle and smiles, then the vehicle will look at them and it will actually smile back. Audi um, have been developing uh, smart headlights, um, which will pick out uh, pedestrians in the road. And seeing as the, the styling of the Audi is so, so aggressive, it, it actually comes across as pretty sinister. And this is, this is quite well demonstrated by the ad campaign they ran to promote this, where they made all the pedestrians look like escape convicts. So yeah, problematic. So with all of the gestures, um, gesture control, with facial recognition, with um, cars that can look to you, cars that can smile at you, with cars that can recognize you, what is the, uh, what is the UX designer, what is the UX um, uh, person doing in the future? What, what, where are they gonna look for for inspiration? Do the, do the old tricks, the old things we went back to still apply? Um, and I don't believe they do. 
And I believe as UX designers, we have to, have to look elsewhere in order to, to find inspiration and to, to really drive innovation um, as individuals or the businesses and the agencies that we work for. Looking elsewhere is not a, uh, not a new thing. Um, rather than use the cliche, um, uh, think outside the box, I thought I'd share with you a story. Back during the Second World War, there was a Jewish mathematician called um, Abraham Wald, and he escaped Austria uh, for America. And he was uh, stationed in an air base and given the task of defending and improving the armor on the B-17 bombers um, who were being shot down over Germany. The bombers would return, and the, him and his team would immediately begin mapping um, all the bullet holes on the aircraft with a view to understand uh, where the armor needs to be enforced. But six weeks into the program, uh, Abraham turned around and said, stop, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to take all the places where there are no holes, and we're going to reinforce them. And the guy was like, well, why would you do that? And he goes, because we're only looking at the aircraft that are returning. He goes, it's the aircraft that aren't returning that we need to be looking after. In short, we were looking in the wrong place. I think we as an industry spend too much time looking internally ourselves. We always look at the, the, award, the DAD award-winning stuff. We look at the, the best on FWA. We, look, um, we hold our heroes high. But I think we need to look, A, outside of our industry, and B, at some of the, uh, the products which haven't worked, and look at ways of improving, um, uh, improving them. I think the, the designer of the future um, will be part animator, part psychologist, part engineer, part behavioral scientist. I think if we can push ourselves out of the, the boxes that we're in at the moment and really engage in other industries, other friends, colleagues, peers who are out there and find different ways of attacking problems of tomorrow, then we ourselves will elevate ourselves in an industry and we'll be a hell of a lot more successful. Thank you very much.